Today, today, as we're starting our Emerge uh, conference, our week, uh, we're going we're gonna to have the speaker tonight, and he's going to also speak on Tuesday, and so you want to make it throughout this week to hear him out, and so we heard him at a leaders conference, we met, a, uh, we didn't meet him at a leaders conference, but we heard him, he was sharing his heart and his passion for everything God was doing through his life, we heard his testimony, um, and then some of my students that went with me were like, dude, we got to bring this guy, we got to bring this guy, and so uh, we weren't able to bring him for our, our spring break, but we are able to uh, bring him this week and for the for the for for our emerge conference and so we're so grateful that he's able to come and so give him a new life welcome Nelson Vargas Jr. Y'all give it up for Pastor Milton please. <laughs> I thought we spoke that day at the conference. We didn't get to talk, huh? I had just moved from Chicago. I was I was lonely here. I don't know anyone outside my church so I like I'm accepting friendship applications if anyone wants to be my friend. And I thought Milton filled one out. I'm disappointed that we didn't talk. But I'm grateful for the invite. A couple thank yous I got to give. Thank you to Pastor David and his beautiful wife uh, for trusting Milton enough to trust his opinion on someone he doesn't know to be in his pulpit on a Sunday. You don't just give your pulpit to anybody. Amen. So that's a, it's an honor. I treat it with respect and reverence. And uh, God bless you and your beautiful church. I thank God for that. And I got to say this. I don't know who does announcements on a regular basis, but Willie is coming for your job. Can I just say that? Where are you at, Willie? Are you in the building? I met you earlier. He's upstairs? Ooh, give it up for Willie. I see you. <laughs> so I'm from Chicago. Willie kind of has, I don't know if he raps, but he had a rapper swag about him. It seemed like whoever was doing the video told him, don't use your hands. You got to keep them here. But he, he couldn't help himself. He was like, so he moved. He was like, if it's your first time at Galveston, welcome. <laughs> I loved it. We got this conference going on. I'm Willie. Oh, I loved it. It was just so great. Got to hire that kid. He's special. He's special. Can I just brag on your worship team for a second, too? You guys are special. They're going to think I'm just saying that because that's like a real, it's a real churchy thing to say when you go places. You just start complimenting everybody. But it's not like that everywhere. Have y'all visited other churches that are, let's not talk about other churches. Praise God. Lord, help them wherever they are today. But I, from 15 and down, 8 years old to 15 years old, I grew up in a small Spanish Pentecostal church. And I'm ashamed because I needed a translator in the first service, right? Because my, my parents used to speak to me in Spanish and I would speak back in English. So, Kids, if you're doing that now, just slap yourself and start learning Spanish. You'll catch up with the English later. It's okay. But I feel like slightly less of a Puerto Rican because of that. So catch up. Catch up if that's you. But um, I, I grew up in a small little church where they would let anybody lead worship. As a matter of fact, they assigned. That's old school. I don't know if any of y'all ever came from a church like that. It was called Didi Hir. And um, they would just be like, uh, eeny, meeny, miny. Hey, Joe, you're going to Didi Hir next weekend. And it was, I'm sorry, but it was using people in giftings that the good Lord had not called them to be good at, right? Like they got that shower voice, you know, just you pray in there, but they'd come up and everyone said the same thing. Hermanos, uh, if you just forgive me, my throat hurts a little bit. And, and then they would just start singing. You were like, my God. And you just worship, but it was tough. You were like having to stop from laughing. And sometimes it was like nail screeching. It was just, it's not, it wasn't as easy as it was today. You guys are amazing, legit. You guys are awesome. Speaking of, Pastor Milton was talking about using me for spring break. My, my wife's like, we should get them for worship for our spring break. So I'm going to talk to y'all. We, we might be in contact over there. Y'all come bless us for a weekend where we have camp. That would be phenomenal. But anywho, and that was that your little son, Kathy? Was that your little son that was, you know he's going to be a worshiper. I was watching him, and he was, he was doing air guitar the whole time. And then when the drummer would get it, he was like, he was like right on beat moving his fist with every, that boy's just blessed already. Anywho, if it seems like I'm excited to be here, it's because I am. I really am. I, I remember a season of my life where I used to come to church out of obligation. I'm going to just tell you the truth. I really did. 
It was Sunday morning. It was the thing you did because my parents raised you and the way you should go. When you're older, you won't depart from it. So I, that was a season I would just go to church. But I didn't really come with any expectation. You know, I came just to, to sit down, and I, I wanted to be seen, kind of check mark a box, make sure pastor saw me. Hey, pastor, I'm here. Don't call me this week talking about where were you, right? You saw me. Get off my case. I was there. I was there. I did my thing. But it's not like that. I, I, I thank God for parents who did raise me in church, uh, even when things weren't 100% going on right in their life uh, at times. But they, they raised me in the way you should go. And I, I don't know why I'm starting with that. But parents, if you have some knuckleheads that uh, don't want to go to church, don't give them an option. What's up with this generation that gives their kids options on coming to church? I don't get that. I never really understood that. You wake them up, Billy? I'm sorry to wake you. I know it's 10. Would, would you like to go to church today? He's like, no. Okay, I'm just going to close the... Come on now, wake them kids up. I didn't have an option. It was church or the belt. And I was like, church hurts less. It's longer, but it hurts less. So I, I just want to be, I choose God's house. We'll go that route. But listen, uh, a month and a half ago, I was in a crazy motorcycle accident. I've been riding motorcycles for seven, eight years, never been in an accident. And any true biker, bri- uh, biker will tell you it's not. It's not if you're in an accident, it's when you're in an accident. So make sure you dress appropriately. And I'm like, yeah, sure, I got you. I just thought I was special. I thought I was that guy. I'm like, I'm never going to crash. I don't ride crazy. I'm not like the guy doing wheelies. I do speed, you know, I speed when I have the the opportunity to. And I'm very cautious. I'm looking around. And um, thankfully, I just started wearing a helmet because some ladies at my church, God bless them, Miss Vicky and uh, Anne Marie, some people are like, they're like my moms now. So they're like, where's your helmet? And I was like, I, I don't own one yet, so you need to buy one. And they got on my case, so I bought a helmet, and I had been in the habit of wearing it a little bit, so I was like, thank God. What I didn't have was a jacket on, because I live in Texas now. <laughs> and it's, this is special. Every time I go outside, anybody's glasses immediately fog up, and you can't see anything. How do y'all deal with that? I got to get used to that, I guess. But it's, it's um, you take a shower, immediately you get out, you're just, I need another one. Like, immediately. The, the humidity is ridiculous here. So I'm leaving church on a Thursday. It's 5 o'clock, I say goodbye to everybody in the office, and I'm like heading home, and I'm off Friday, so is my wife, so that's, that's our weekend, right? And um, I make a left, and I decided to take the back roads. There's no back roads in Chicago. It's a concrete jungle. Everything's buildings, skyscrapers. So where I live, there's a, a highway you can take to get home, and it's, you know, basic road, but then the back roads, man, there's like a little creek you pass over and all these beautiful trees, and y'all might be used to it, especially living in Galveston. Everything's beautiful here. Y'all probably, y'all probably take it for granted living here, but I, I didn't even know people lived here like lived here. I thought it was just a vacation town. I was like, people get to stay here? I'm like, I was like, God, why did you come to Galveston? No, but, but anyway, um, so I, I make my left turn out of the parking lot, and I'm driving, I'm cruising on my bike, going about 40, 45, praise the Lord, and um, I, I think I see something out of the corner of my eye. You ever had that? You feel like someone's staring at you or something, and you're like, you give that little look. I saw something. It was black. It was low. And um, I didn't even have time to really look and, and comprehend what was about to happen, but it was a bird. I don't know people in my church teased me. They said, you got hit by a mosquito. No, it wasn't a mosquito. <laughs> it was a pterodactyl. It was big. And I don't even know what kind of bird it was. People want to ask me, well, what kind of bird? I, I didn't have time to study it. I don't know if it was a, I don't know if it was a vulture or a hawk or a, a pigeon. or I don't know what it was, but I got hit by it. And it was flying low, and it hit me right in my face. Uh, when you're going 45 miles an hour, when you get hit with even a pebble in your face, if you've ever been that, going that speed and maybe had your head out the window or ever been on a motorcycle, it hurts. And uh, it hit me in the jaw. I just remember that. And it spun my head this way. And there was never this memory. And it must have it must have been like a quick little knockout, maybe, I'm thinking. Because there was never this memory where I look back like in slow motion like, oh, no. <laughs> and I'm falling. I never had that memory. It was that. My next memory was spinning down the middle of the street like this, shoulder over shoulder. And every time my shoulder hit down the street, I can see ahead of me. My bike was like 20 feet or so ahead of me doing somersaults on the street. So every time I saw my, and in that crazy state, I remember still thinking like, oh, no, my bike. Can I? <laughs> my bike. I'm like, one more time. My bike. I'm not even thinking about my life, right? <laughs> thinking about my bike. She was sexy. I named her Black Beauty. She was just custom exhaust pipes, and she was just gorgeous, man. And that's all I was thinking out of the second. I couldn't believe that this was happening to me. I really couldn't. And um, finally, I skid to a stop on the side of the road, and I'm just laying there. And I'm, 
that just happened. <laughs> so immediately I start wiggling my fingers, and I'm like, I have all of them. And I look down, I, I check out my toes, and I'm like, I, feel, I can't see through my shoes, but I'm like, it feels like they're all there. I'm like, praise God. I, I start licking my teeth, like, and touching to see if they're all there in my mouth. Because I don't know what I look like right now. I don't have a mirror there. So I'm like, they're, you know, they're crooked, but I need them all. So I'm like, they're there, they're there. I don't want to whistle when I preach, so I need, I need them all. I need them all right there. So everything was there. I'm touching my face, and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I looked at my helmet. I took it off expecting to see all these marks. Tell me why my helmet didn't have a scratch on it. It was really unbelievable. I was like, that's a good helmet right here. I was like, praise God. So and then, then I started uh, taking inventory of the rest of my body. I looked at my arms, and they're dripping with blood. And I'm like, okay, that's not good. But I have arms, right? You got to be like weigh the pros and cons here. Like I could be armless. I have arms that are injured. That's a better scenario. So I'm like, thank you, Lord, for these arms right here. I have a hand that moves. And okay, cool. I'm checking stuff out. I look down to like kind of take an assessment of my legs, and I realize that my pants are almost not there anymore. They were shredded completely. I had like some kind of like they weren't jeans. They were kind of like a khaki khaki kind of pants with like a little green pant I had just shredded everywhere. Like this whole section was missing. And I'm like, I'm almost naked out here now. And I'm looking around. So I'm like, wow, and I'm just bleeding from a bunch of different areas of my leg. My, I, I didn't really feel pain for the first few minutes because I was just in shock. Adrenaline's pumping. I don't know if you ever, any of you have ever been in an accident. You know, adrenaline just takes over and kind of increases so that it can, it can help you get through that moment. But my knee hurt immediately. I was like, and it looked like a chunk of it was missing. I was like, something's wrong. <laughs> so I'm like, that doesn't look good, but I have a knee, so thank God for that. Um, I, I look around, and um, no cars are passing by. And I'm like, no, no problem. Uh, phone. Phone, call for help. Yes, brain's still working. I go to reach for my pocket. Uh, my pocket isn't there anymore. My pants literally shredded from here down. <laughs> so everything that was inside my pockets was somewhere on the street there. I couldn't get up to go get it because I just I already knew my leg was messed up. I'm like, I'm not even going to try to stand on that because I don't want to just bend all the way over and it breaks on me. I don't know what's going on. So I'm like, okay, I don't have a phone. Um, oh, man, I'm in trouble. I need some help. As soon as I was thinking that, I see a woman coming down the road this way. And uh, my bike, again, was like maybe where that section is. So I'm laying in the street, and I see her slow down to look at my bike. And I'm like, oh, she's going to help me. So she looks at the bike, and she's like. <laughs> and she stops. She's, man, she's taking inventory. She's like. And she's looking around because it's weird just to see a motorcycle there and no people. So she's like, someone just left this here? Like, what's happening? So then she cruises up a little bit ahead. She didn't speed, and she, she locks eyes with me. So I know she saw me. And I'm there, and I'm like, help me. Help me. And there's blood just falling all over. And she's like. <laughs> she left me there. I'll talk about that later. I ran out of time in the first service, so I forgot to talk about that at the end. But she left me there. And I, I didn't even have time to be sad about it at the moment. But I was like. <laughs> and I was like, how could anyone do that? There's. The, I'm bleeding to death here. I'm like, I need help. And she looked, her jaw dropped, and she just kept driving. And then I prayed. And I regret not praying sooner. I should have just prayed immediately, right? But then I was like, oh, yeah, Jesus, right? He loves me. So I'm like, let me, let me pray here. I'm like, God, I'm in bad shape. I need help. As soon as I prayed that, no cars had come this way for a while. All of a sudden, three cars in a row came. They all immediately pulled over. All of them had multiple men inside the car, and all of them got out. And each started performing different tasks as if there was like a project coordinator that's like, all right, you grab this. You call 911. You grab his pants. What's left of them? You do this. And I was like, it was, it was, it was surreal to watch. The first guy comes out. He's like, who can I call? And I'm like, um, my, my wife, my wife. And I'm, he's like, okay, give me the number. I'm like, all right, 773. Got the Chicago area code. Hey. So I'm like, 773. Um, and then he dials it. And then I realized Never mind, that's my phone number. I just gave him my phone number to call my wife. So I started realizing, man, I'm out of it right now. I'm like, okay, 727, I started giving my wife's number. He calls my wife. Uh, I don't remember the phone call at all, but my wife says I was hysterical. She was like, you were just like, you're injured, I'm injured. Help me, but I'm okay. Don't worry about me. But I'm bleeding so bad right now. Nothing to worry about, but I may lose my knee. She just told me all this stuff. I'm like, I did not say that. But any, somewhere along the line, I must have led a clue to where I was because she found me. Uh, they, another person called 911 while I was on the phone with my wife. Um, two other gentlemen or three other gentlemen went to go pick up my bike from the middle of the street and get it out of the way for other traffic to be able to go through safely. They stood it up, and they were able to get it off the road. 
And what all of the meanwhile, there was another guy in a suit, white dude, dressed head to toe, tie, nice suit, nice shoes. And he was wandering around in like knee high grass. It was muddy. And he's just not saying a word. And he's just seeking and searching. Oh, here's your phone. And he would just walk back and be like, here you go. Actually, he didn't say that. He just kind of tossed it. I'm like, hmm, hmm, thank you. My wallet tosses it right by me. I didn't realize I didn't have my wallet, obviously, because I wasn't looking for money. I was just looking for a phone at the time. But I was like, I guess I have no back pockets. Maybe things are showing back there as well. This is going to be a fun 911 visit. But um, he just starts returning to me. Keys, all these things that I had lost. I think he, he might even brought my chapstick back. I'm like, good looking out. Got these big Puerto Rican lips. Got to keep these things chapped even during an accident. So he's just returning all the stuff to me. And I'm like, wow. He didn't say a word. Just seeking and searching, bringing me all my items back. Someone called 911, moving my motorcycle off the street, calling my wife. All this stuff happened. I'm just like, thank you, Jesus. I don't even have time to really think about that lady uh, who, who did that to me, right? I, I didn't have time to think about that until later. But um, all, all the while, I was, in a, I was in a wheelchair probably for like uh, three, three and a half weeks. Afterwards, I couldn't walk. I was a bad uh, patient, I got to say. How many men, and I'm not even going to ask the men, wives, go ahead and tell on your husbands for me real quick. How many of your husbands are babies when they're sick, when they get a cold? <laughs> they get a cold, and they, they can't even move anymore. They call in sick from work with the sniffles. <laughs> I'm not even going to point. I got something looking at me like, I can't raise my hand. They're just blinking like. <laughs> I'm like, I see you, I see you, I see you out there. <laughs> Man trying to look all tough like that ain't, that ain't me. I'm a baby when I'm sick. I'll just be honest. I am. And I was a bad patient. And um, it was funny because in the hospital, they gave me morphine, and I still had adrenaline going. And our youth group was leaving to camp uh, the very next week on Tuesday. And I'm there on morphine and adrenaline. Like, I'm going to camp next week. I'm still taking our students. Well, I'll be fine. And my wife's like, of, of course you are, baby. You're going to take our kids to camp next week. And everyone's like, he's not going anywhere. He just doesn't realize what's going on right now. So... Um, that was the case for the first year in a long time. I didn't get to take my own students to youth camp, and uh, it was tough, man. I missed them. It was a, uh, but they, thank God. So, you know, isn't it funny how sometimes we think God can't move if we're not around, like if we're that special? And God just completely blew my students' minds. They came back changed with testimonies to the glory of God and uh, on fire for Christ. I was like, thank you. Uh, Assemblies of God South District Texas camps, right? They, they tore it up over there. But I'm there with my wife, and I was a bad patient. Things were hurting. I couldn't stand. She had to wheel me to the bathroom. Uh, wheel me back. Um, one good uh, not married man, I'm not talking to students. Y'all cover yours for a second, but uh, sponge baths were pretty cool. I thank God. I couldn't get in the, they told me you cannot get inside a shower or a bathtub with what you got because I had no skin. Matter of fact, let's show some pictures. If you're squeamish, look away, close your eyes and worship uh, for a second. But uh, that was some of them, right? This was the day after the accident uh, on my arms. The knee, that was a picture I got like a week later. So the the actual day of picture, I think my wife has on her phone, is pretty crazy. But I was just, I was, I was hurting. All that skin was gone. And even it for, with it just touching air was like fire. And they were like, it's because you lost all this skin. Like, this is nerve showing. I'm like, hmm, can I get more morphine? They're like, no, we're going to give you these pills. But uh, <laughs> you go ahead and pray. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, I need you right now, Lord. I was hurting. I was hurting. I was in bad shape. And uh, I started thinking about what kind of scars that was going to leave. And I remember getting sad for a little bit. Because I've been pretty fortunate in life as far as physical scars are concerned. Some people joke around, like, looking at my hands. They're like, you should be a hand model. Like, you look like you haven't worked a hard day in your life. I'm like, that may be insulting, but thank you. <laughs> they are quite nice. And I'm thinking, like, now I've got, like, holes here, and I can't clap the same. I remember that. Because, like, even during worship, you know, this is real love. I was like, I forget. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> and I'm like, Pulling me closer and closer. I got to, like, look for other things to slap because I can't, I can't clap like I used to just yet. God's still healing me. I'm on my way. But um, I, I was thinking about what are these scars going to look like? You know, there was a big chunk of my arm. And now this, this arm's already scarred up. So it's, uh, it's, an, and it's interesting. The skin's growing back in different colors. I'm, like, 17% Caucasian on this forearm now. And I'm like, that'll work. You know, it might help me with a loan in the future. But I'm like, that'll, that's good. <laughs> And this arm, this arm is, um, I got like, it's, I've been outside a lot, and they told me I shouldn't have, have, have exposed it, but I did. So it's, you know, a good percentage, like African American. My Taino Indian Boricua roots are showing through, and I'm like, praise God, that's, a, that's my strong arm right there. I like that, I like that. So, and I, I was a little embarrassed about it. I started thinking, man, I live in the hottest place in the world. Like, Texas feels like the equator sometimes. 
And I'm like, I'm going to have to preach in sweaters <laughs> like the rest of my life because I'm just, I don't want people to get distracted by like whatever, you know, grotesque things is on my arm. And um, it was just, it was tough. And um, I just remember thinking, what are these scars going to look like? I had a friend who was like, maybe you should tattoo them. And I'm like, well, that doesn't sound painful at all. Let's just stab a needle through everything that just happened there, and that'll take care of everything. But, you know, it was, people were giving me different options, and I'm like, I'm just going to let God heal, and I'm not going to be ashamed of my scars. And it brought me to a study in Scripture, and we're going to talk about that in just a bit as far as what I learned there. But uh, we all have scars. All of us have scars. And the beautiful thing about a scar is that it's, it's a mark left behind by a wound that's been healed. That's, that's the thing. It's, a scar shouldn't hurt anymore, right, because they've been healed. It's just a mark that reminds you, it's just evidence that something happened, but you overcame. Something happened, but now you're healed. You once were broken, but now you're fixed. So it shouldn't be a thing of embarrassment. It should be a thing of pride. I can't tell people I've been in a motorcycle accident and, mm hmm show me your scars. Now I was like, Whoosh, take that. You know, I show them. I got proof that I, that I ride. I got proof about that. And um, we all have scars. That's my first point. All of us have scars. Maybe if you're young and you're in here, you're like, I don't have any scars yet. Well, boo-boo, keep living. I promise you. You're going to have some scars. In John 16, 33, Jesus warned us. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. Why do we act so surprised when trouble comes our way then? God, am I, did I do something wrong? No. Sometimes it's because you're doing something right. You're just, you're just an earthling living on earth. And God says, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have trials. Other translations say you will have tribulation. That's not just a normal little, oh, I got fired. That's intense pain hurt. And that brings me to the next part. We all have physical scars, but there's emotional scars as well. Some of you in here look good today. I'm going to say all of you. New life, y'all look beautiful. Every single person in here, right? Beautiful church. Praise God. Some of you, uh, you, don't look, you don't look like what you've been through, right? I can't tell just by looking at you. But if I could see your heart, if I could see inside, if I could see your spirit, if I could see where your mind's at psychologically, if I could, if I could know and be intimate with your emotions, there might be some scars there. And here's the thing about a scar. Again, it's a mark left behind by a wound that's what? Been healed. So if you don't have a scar, I present to you that you might not have a scar because you're not healed yet. If you're here and you have a wound that's not healed yet, can I tell you it's not because God doesn't want to heal that. It's because you haven't allowed the healer to come in contact with you. And, you know, there's sometimes we have this false thinking where, you know what, I'm too dirty. Y'all ever? <laughs> I thought that back in the day. I remember when I backslid around 20 years old. I had a church hurt. I remember I wanted to work with youth, but nobody invited me to be a youth leader. So I was like, I don't, I don't really know what to do. I was, I was 19, 20 years old, and I was like, I want to I wanna be here. I want to help students. I had a love already in my heart for students, and I'm like, but I'm too old to be here. I get that. I feel that. So I started sitting away from where the students sat. So like the set, students would sit there, and I'm like, well, let me do something to, to show people I'm not trying to be here with, with as a student. I'm trying to do something to be different. So I would sit on the front row here where my pastor sat. And he'd preach. I'd bring his Bible up for him, make sure he had his water. He sweat like me. So I'd make sure he had a little towel, did all this. And I was just, his armor bearer trying to follow him, do whatever I could to serve. I was organizing chairs, doing all this stuff. And then one day, I was, I was sitting on the front row listening to a good sermon. Pastor Danny Lopez, he was preaching. I'm like, mmm. And my church where I grew up in, we make noise. Like, we're not quiet. You could say stuff. I like church like that. So I've been to church where we're like, amen. And everybody's like, oh, this is a quiet church. I'm sorry. I'll just... I'll let the rocks cry out instead. I'll just sit here. I'll get, whatever. And I'm like, amen, Pastor Danny, preach. And then all of a sudden I hear a tap. I feel a tap on my shoulder. And I'm like, I'm in the middle of a word. That's kind of rude to start a conversation. So I look back, and this lady, no lie, Pastor David, she was a youth leader. She's like, um, finger in everything. <laughs> Puerto Rican lady. Aren't you a little too old to still become a youth ministry? And I was like, and she was a high up, you know, high ranking youth leader, in my opinion. I looked up to her at one point and I was like, huh. and I'm a, I'm a Chicago halfway saved, halfway thug Christian that loves Jesus. So I'm like, I got up and I'm just like, she was right behind me. I just, I look, I just looked at her and I walked off, middle of the service. And I just left. And I remember nobody called me. Nobody checked to see, like, what happened to church? Why'd you storm off like that? Nothing. And I just used that as an excuse to just rebel. 20 was a bad year for me. I would say I lost my virginity, but you don't, you, you don't lose something like that. You give that away. I started uh, following in the steps of my father. My father, uh, at one point in his life, struggled with drug addiction. I didn't go as far as him, but I started smoking. I started drinking. I started using that as an excuse to just 
kind of rebel against everything I knew I should be doing because I was hurt. And I used that church hurt as an excuse to just kind of to kind of push people away. So that was an emotional scar for me. That was a church hurt uh, that I dealt with. And I don't know why I didn't share that in the first service. I don't know why I'm sharing it here. Holy Ghost, do your thing. If you have a church hurt, my God, let it go. So often we think we're hurting the other person by hanging on to this unforgiveness. You're hurting nobody but yourself. The Bible says that when, you, when someone offends you and you don't forgive them, that God cannot forgive you for your sin. Isn't that crazy? He already paid the price for your forgiveness, but he can't forgive you because you enjoy being the forgiven and not being the forgiver. And God's like, Christianity doesn't work that way. I forgive you, you forgive others. I forgive you, you forgive others. You keep doing that. A, that's a cycle. Who are you to hold somebody in unforgiveness like you've never done anything wrong? Forgive them. But they're not sorry. I didn't ask if they were sorry. Forgive them. If y'all don't like me, that's cool. I'm about to leave in a bit. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to get some food. And, uh, but I'm going to keep preaching this. So forgive, forgive. As, as, as often as they hurt, forgive. Forgive. Don't hold resentment. You're only hurting yourself with that. But there's emotional scars. I've got physical scars now. There's emotional scars. I, I thought about marriage. I grew up in a family where my dad was unfaithful at, a, at a, several different points. And my mom, uh, it's a miraculous story. She was going to divorce my father. She had every right to. He was being, he was being an awful husband, if I'm just telling the truth. And, um, you know, he was, he was on drugs and he was doing things. And she's like, I've had it. And at the time, she wasn't going to church, I don't believe. So a friend invited her to her church. And there were some, there were some prophets there that night. Praise God for a man of God, for a prophet of God. So she's sitting there hurt, crying throughout the entire sermon. And she's like, I'm just going to go forward for prayer. Nobody in that church knew her from anyone. And she went up for prayer. And before she could even say anything, she just started crying, and the prophet looks at her and says, look at me. And said, God says you are not to leave that man. And she was like, You're like, you don't know me from anybody. This is straight from God. So my mom honored that. And can I just tell you now, fast forward, because I don't, I don't got time to share this whole testimony. My father preaches and teaches the gospel in Puerto Rico right now. He is completely changed, completely saved. He's been redeemed. It's a beautiful thing. My mother, she teaches the, the Dalmas. She's over there in Puerto Rico. Uh, she does Sunday school. She works with the youth. And it's just, it's just beautiful. It could have really took a turn elsewhere. And I remember growing up in horrible neighborhoods where everybody I hung out with and played basketball with was in a gang. I wasn't because I feared my father more than I feared the gangs. And he told me, I will kill you. I will end your life if you join a gang. And I was like, but they're all, okay, cool. I got you. I got it. So I never, but I remember thinking if they would have got divorced just to hurt them, I'm going to join the next day if y'all if y'all split and put us through that. And while they never did it, we had divorce running rampant in our family. And I had cousins that I loved and I was really close to. And all of a sudden, we'd get together for Thanksgiving, and then half their family was missing because half went to another house. Or if they did bring someone, like a, a stepwife or a, a you know, stepmom or stepdad, all of a sudden there was drama and people were talking, and it just got really bad. And I remember feeling the hurt of that. You know, when stuff like that happens, it's not just the couple that hurts the community hurts. People grieve that. And uh, I just remember growing up and not realizing, just seeing it, it started warping my perception of what true love and true marriage really is. So that led me on a string of bad relationships when I'm, you know, 20 and up, looking for the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing, living the wrong way, until I finally met my wife. And we're friends, and I'm like, I knew she was special. I was like, man, I was like, if I'm going to get married ever in life, that's the one. Because I just, everything in life's better with her. She's just amazing. But there was this it took me a while to get there, not because of her, but because I realized I had an emotional or psychological scar from everything I was, uh, you know, subjected to in my life, seeing marriage just destroyed, seeing the hurt that it caused. And, you know, I was looking at statistics and, two, uh, you know, they say two out of every three marriages end in divorce. So I'm like, why would I want that, God? And then God started working on my heart. He's like, that's not real love. I'm not calling you to that. And, you know, I started reading 1 Corinthians 13. And how many of you guys know this will renew your mind, right? The world, the world tells you something, and you're used to the world's methods, but that's what Paul tells us. Don't be conformed to the customs and the behavioral patterns of the word, but be transformed, right? Learn to think. Be renewed. Be new again by this. And God, everything in life is in here. Everything we need to live is in here. We have no excuse for not knowing. It's just because we're not reading, right? So we got to have the word in us. So I, I start reading, studying, you know, 1 Corinthians 13, what real love is, what marriage is. I start reading in Genesis how the first time God ever says something's not good is when man is alone. I don't know if you ever caught that. It's like God's like, let there be light, and it was good. God's like, let's make these animals, and it was good. Let's do this and grass and flowers and trees, and it was good. Of course it's good. God made it, right? It doesn't make junk. So it's awesome. It's, all, it's, it's good, it's good, it's good. Then you get to that verse where it's like, it is not good for man to be alone. I was like, wow, you just made everything. Everything was perfect, but you're like, this isn't good. 
he had just has animals to hang out with. It's weird for, <laughs> for Adam to just be chilling with horses and hippopotamuses, and he needs something. So God brings along Eve, and, you know, that was, that was, that, was that, that first marriage, that perfect union. And God started opening up my heart to marriage, and as soon as I understood that and as soon as he changed my mind and healed me from the emotional and psychological scars that I had, my view of marriage, man, I couldn't propose to this girl fast enough. I planned this picnic. It was beautiful. She had no idea. All of a sudden, I was like, oh, what about this ring, though? I was <laughs> like, this ring, though, girl. I got on my knees. She was crying. That We were, like, at the, in Lake Michigan, like, on the beach in Chicago. All of a sudden, like, there was, like, random swans and things surrounding us. I'm like, thank you, Jesus, for theatrics. I got animals. <laughs> A bear just like, Rrr, say yes. You know, it's like things were happening, so it was beautiful. But listen, that was a serious emotional scar that I needed to be healed from. And sometimes we don't realize stuff like that until later on in life. We're like, wow, I, I treat authority figures with this kind of attitude because someone did something to me. And maybe someone said something to you growing up. Maybe, maybe you're the black sheep of your family. Let's not pretend like every family doesn't have the black sheep of the family, right? That person that when it's Thanksgiving or Christmas, everybody gets together, you're just looking at them like, mm-hmm, there he is. Can't believe he showed up. And, of course, he didn't bring any food. He's just coming to eat everything. But he brought Tupperware. He's about to take leftovers, uh-huh. Real nice, uncle. Good job, Theo. <laughs> Pastor, Pastor, we should have a separate altar call for those people right now. If you're the person that never brings anything and you just take all the leftover plates, just come forward right now. We want to pray for you here at New Life today. <laughs> oh, my word. But maybe you are. Maybe you're the black sheep of the family, and all of us have us. Maybe you messed up, and it was so public. And nowadays, everything's public because social media. You could do something in China. I'll find out on my phone in like 10 seconds. I'll be like, no, she didn't. I'm looking at pictures and stuff. Everything's out there. So maybe you've been labeled as something. Maybe you're the cheater in your family. Wow, he had a good wife, and he messed that all up. He has the nerve to show up during Christmas talking about <laughs> Secret Santa. Get You better get, get your big. <laughs> and they label you. There's the cheater, right? Hey, there's the failure. Um, <laughs> I ain't going to lie. There was someone in our family that was nicknamed Can't Get Right. Y'all got one of those? He tries, but he's, there goes Can't Get Right. because <laughs> He just can't get right. He can't get his stuff together. And we got to be careful with letting people label you things. Maybe some people have labeled you some harsh things, and you know. Tuesday, we could talk about it a little more in youth, right? But people just put labels on you. They, they call you things. And if we hear something enough, eventually you start to what? You start to believe that. You're like, maybe I, am, maybe I am loose. Maybe I am this dirty person that they're talking about. Maybe I am irresponsible. Maybe I am just like my father or like my mother. Maybe I won't amount to anything. And we start to accept that identity for ourselves instead of understanding that because our father's royalty, that makes us royalty. That I'm preaching to a room full of princes and princesses because you serve the king, right? But we lose sight of that because we let somebody else label us. You know, earlier, earlier I said that my, my bike, some of y'all laughed. Shame on you. My, my bike's name was Black Beauty because she's black and she's beautiful, right? That's my bike. It was a used bike, but guess what? I paid money and I bought that bike back. I redeemed that bike. So as that bike's redeemer and purchaser, I'm the only one who has a right to name that bike whatever I choose to name it. You could call it ugly. You could call it slow. You could call it fast. You can call it a death machine. You call it whatever you want to. But that name's not going to stick because the only one who has the right to label something is the creator of that thing, the owner of that thing. You are a child of the Most High God. I don't care what anyone said to you beforehand. God is the only one who can call you something. He calls you loved. He calls you forgiven. He calls you appointed, anointed. He has work for you to do. The Bible says that we are God's masterpiece created anew in Christ. Not just a little leftover thing like, what are we going to do with these spare pieces here? What are we going to do? Let's build her. No. The Bible says that we are his masterpiece. Think about everything that God created. Think about the mountains and the Grand Canyon. Y'all ever seen the Grand Canyon or like Niagara Falls, one of the you know, seven wonders of the world? You're like, wow, God. I remember the first time I saw the Grand Canyon, it literally took my breath away. I'm a city boy. I've never seen a hole that big. I was like, what in the world? And I remember uh, they told me we were getting close. And I was like, we're almost here. And if you've ever been, there's like, there's like forests and there's all these trees blocking. And I'm like, I was like just looking out the window like, where is it though? I don't see it. And then the first glimpse I caught of it, there was like a, a section where there was no trees. And we probably got to drive like one, two, three. And then we were, you thought I was going to fall off the stage, right? <laughs> she was like, there goes your other knee, Papa. No, no, no. Holy Ghost got me. But listen, when I first... Laid eyes on the Grand Canyon. 
It was that three-second window. I was in the car. We weren't even there. We didn't park and get out yet. I saw it. And I was like, <gasps> and I, I, I kid you not, I was in absolute awe of God. I'm like, you made this. This isn't an accident. How crazy is this? And to think, you think you would label something like that your masterpiece. Nope. He says, you are my masterpiece. You are my most prized possession, the most beautiful thing I've ever made. The thing that I created and lost because sin entered the world and the thing that I'm going to die to get back because I can't live without you. You are my most prized possession. So know that if you're in here, you have low self-esteem, you better shake that off right now and realize that you are God's masterpiece. Amen? So God has scars. We all have scars. God has scars. Let me take you to John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. And just to give you a little background on this, it's, it's Sunday night at this point. It's Sunday evening. Earlier that day, uh, you know, I'm sure the, the I, I saw a preacher talk about this one time, said that the devils and the, you know, devil and the demons were probably having a party. Like, we killed Jesus. We did it. You know, we killed the Messiah. The Messiah. He's dead. He's been rotting in the grave. And then God's like, psych. <laughs> he just gets up like, he just defeats death, hell, and the grave. Who does that? Our God does that. So he resurrected. The disciples don't know it just yet, so they're scared. They're like, if they can kill Jesus like that, what about us? We're nobody. They're going to they're gonna come for us next. They know us. So they're in behind locked doors. Verse 19. It says, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. How many of y'all would be freaked out by that if that happened at your house? Y'all lock the doors real good before you go to sleep? I don't know about Galveston. Is it safe here? Y'all lock your doors when you go to sleep? Chicago, you lock everything always. If you're going to the car for two seconds, you hit, you hit the alarm like seven times. I, I heard the beep, but I just want to make sure. I don't know if I heard the lock engage. I just, I'm just going to H-E-B. I'll be back. But imagine that. You're just there, locked doors. You're worried. Like, all right, one, two, three, it's just, it's just us. And I'll start like, peace, be still. Ah! I just... I'd be terrified if that happened. I'm going to just be honest. So they're scared. And Jesus was, says, was standing there among them. He says, peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds. And I would pick the one translation that says wounds. Almost every other translation says mark, which now we know that scars are a mark left behind by a wound that's been healed. Jesus didn't come back resurrected all bloody, right? He wasn't like getting blood all over the table like, guys, check this out. It's like, that'd be a little weird. So he was healed, but he had scars. He had marks. Uh, so the, the, the wounds in his hands inside, they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. I'm going to fast forward to verse 24. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. There's an exclamation mark there, right? You got to make sure you read your Bibles right. You can't be like, we saw the Lord. Some excitement, right? This guy was crucified, and guess what? He was here at the house. He came. We saw the Lord, right? So they're telling him this. All of them are telling him this. These are his brothers. These are his, his, his closest compadres. These are his people. They're telling him this. I think I would have believed it if my family, my wife tells me anything, I trust her that much. I'm just like, what she says is almost Bible, right? It's like, it is written. <laughs> Di Diane said it. Like, I trust her. I just, I do. She's not going to lie to me like that. We got that going on. But he said this, but he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wounds in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, if I'm Thomas, I'm feeling real scared at this moment, like, Because he knows everything. So I'm thinking, like, Jesus is going to come to be like, come here. Y'all do coco tassos? Y'all remember those? Get whooped. You were going to get hit. He's like, did you figure Jesus was going to rebuke him? How dare you of little faith, boy? It's like something. I would just be wet, ready to get the wrath. And Jesus just gives, gives him grace. I love this. Um, he's with him. Uh, he, says, he says to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. And he tells him, don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And then what does he say? My Lord and my God, he, he exclaimed, right? Then Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. And I love this. Before Jesus was, uh, the ascension happened, 
it was a 40-day period. You know, we think like Easter is real quick and it's just a couple of, no, he hung out for 40 days on earth. The Bible says he showed himself to hundreds of people. And I, and I love it because Jesus has scars. You think about this. And, and, and you know, I think about, about what that might have looked like when the resurrection took place. Like, oh, all beautiful. I picture, like, how many of you have ever seen Beauty and the Beast? Not the new one, the cartoon back in the day. Well, well, Beast would turn into a prince at the end. There's all these lights, and he's floating, and all of a sudden he transforms into this beautiful thing. Sometimes I have, I have a vivid imagination, right? I picture the resurrection maybe looking something like that. And somewhere in all that power that was going on, you figure Jesus just could have, God could have made Jesus just looking perfect, like his skin flawless, oil of Olay, noxema, just everything, not a, not a pimple, not a scratch. But he comes back, and he has scars, and there's a reason for that, right? He knew that Thomas was going to be doubting. And, we, you know, we talk about that, but, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself real quick. Let me just, let me just go rewind for a second and just give that first point. Because some of y'all got this little sheet in front of you, and you're an A-type personality. And if I don't answer your question, you're going to be like, I don't receive anything else you say the rest of the sermon because you didn't give me number two. So I'm looking at you. I forgot about that. I'm sorry. I'm used to preaching a little more extemporaneous. Forgive me. Um, they, they prove his humanity, right? God has scars. They prove his humanity, the scars. We know that God is 100% God. He is sovereign. He's holy. He's divine. He is God. And we, we accept that real quick. But so many times we forget that he was 100% human too. God got tired and God slept. Isn't that awesome? Like God's, you can just picture hanging out with God's like, I'm going to hit the hay, y'all. I'm getting real tired. Like, but you're God. But I'm 100% human too. So I'm going to need this after church nap, right? After we go to whatever restaurant he was talking about. Hopefully, y'all take me to. Not McDonald's. No, I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking. <laughs> Jesus needed naps. Jesus got hungry, and Jesus ate. Jesus had to use the restroom, and guess what? He used the restroom. And it wasn't anything like, oh, holy. It was normal, like, y'all use the restroom. (laughs) Let me not get into detail there. Y'all use your imaginations. Things happen. He was 100% human. Jesus experienced pain. He experienced hurt. Jesus wept. We don't serve a God who is unfamiliar with your pain. He lived it. He knows what this bag of flesh feels like. He knows what our thoughts are. He knows what concerns people of earth. He understands. We don't serve someone who's like, so. oh, well, you've never been in my shoes. God's like, I made your shoes. I walked in your shoes. Don't make me take those shoes. Like, I know. I know what I'm doing. So it just proved his humanity, and I love that. And you get a little skeptical when someone seems a little too perfect, you know? Someone who doesn't have any scars, someone that never does anything wrong. I'm like, are you real? Like... Do you bleed? <laughs> right? So the Bible says that Jesus didn't cling to his God powers, right? And I think about that even while he was dying, right? I, I couldn't have been God. I would have made a horrible God, y'all. If I'm 100% God, too, while I'm on the cross, I'm going to be like, God mode. <laughs> you know, that's just been like, I'd have been like, I don't, oh, I would have been crying like I felt something. Oh, the nails! I don't even feel it. I don't even feel it. Because I'm clinging to my God power and I don't feel it. Y'all think I feel it, but I don't. No, uh God literally allowed himself to experience everything that sinners who died without Christ, would experience. He died a couple deaths on the cross. He died a physical death. The second one is the worst death. This is the death he saved us from because we're all going to die. I I shouldn't have called the sermon, we're all going to die. If that was the title of the sermon, would y'all have came today? Galveston, we're all going to die. Praise God, let's go home. Altar go. We are. We are. This is temporary. The Bible says that life is a mist. It's a tent. It's a temporary dwelling place, right? We're all going through this earth real quick, and we're going to spend eternity in one of two places. That's the death that was the, the most crazy death. We look, at, we look at the physical aspect, but the emotional aspect, the spiritual aspect of that, when sinners die without Christ, there's spiritual death. Your soul is separated from God for all of eternity. That is hell. I don't ever want to even think about what that's like, to be separate, to never be able to hear God's voice, to never feel his touch, to never get to understand and know his love again. That is spiritual death. That's why I believe when, when God was on the cross and he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, right? He's starting to experience his separation, like what's going on? Because God and sin, they don't dwell in the same place, right? I can forgive you of sin, heal sin, I can, I can get rid of that, but no, no, you became sin. He became sin for us. Think about how much he loves you, how crazy in love with you someone must be to become sin for you and to die for you in that manner. And it's just, it's just wild to me. So that just, it proved his humanity. He experienced the pain. He understood all about that. Secondly, it proved his love. We just talked about that. How crazy God must love you. Picture the person on earth right now that loves you the most. Just do that for 10 seconds. There's probably people in your life that are like, she's here. I think he's here. Who loves you the most on earth? 
where they would give you the shirt off their back right now. They would go to the hospital to visit you. They would pay your rent if you didn't have money. Who loves you that much on this earth? Get that image in your head. Some of y'all are pointing. <laughs> right here. This guy. Imagine, and you don't have to imagine because it's the truth. God loves you infinitely more than that person ever could or ever will. It's enduring. It's forever. It's an everlasting love. I've loved you with an everlasting love. There's no amount of sin you could do that would ever make me say, you know what? I regret making him. He loves you the same in sin, out of sin, before sin. He's still a righteous judge, so he will judge sin, but he doesn't love you any less. And if you choose to go to hell, because some people say, oh, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? He doesn't send people to hell. We choose to go to hell when we reject his gift. While he's sending us away, saying, depart from me, I never knew you. It's not because I didn't want to know you. It's because you didn't let me know you. And with tears in his eyes, he's going to be sending some of us away. Like, you never gave me the chance. Never let me have a relationship with you. Never let me heal you. That was your choice. Still loves us, even though we'll never feel that again. Even though we're eternally separated, God will still love us because it's an everlasting love. So he proved his love. I want to close with this. Scars, scars tell a good story. Or they, t- they tell a story for his glory. Um, one of the nicknames for Thomas in Scripture, not even in Scripture, because they actually nicknamed him the twin. You never read anywhere where it says doubting Thomas, right? It's something we kind of threw on him. And it's, a, it's, a, it's still a phrase nowadays where someone doubts a lot. You can be like, oh, look at you, doubting Thomas. Like someone will say that. That's where that derives from. Think about this. He was a disciple. Do you think Thomas saw Jesus perform miracles before? Absolutely. You read a little earlier, he was around when, when, John, when, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Stinky Lazarus, wrapped up like, God, you're too late. You missed Y'all spent too much time at Whataburger. You missed it. He's dead now. Like, it's too late. There's nothing that can be done. Lazarus, come forth. <gasps> you raise people from the dead? What? This same Jesus. This is the guy he was, with, he was with. This is the same guy he left everything to follow. And even he still had doubts. How much more do you think your coworkers doubt God? If a disciple of Christ doubts that he could really be resurrected. How much do your family members, students, how, how much do your fellow students, your cousins, your family, your friends, they have doubts. And I, I, I love that, that there was, there was this, this had to work out that way. There, was, there needed to be people that were close to God that doubted, and God needed to come back, and he needed to show them the scars to prove it. And he wasn't mad at them. It was all part of the plan. Because Christianity is not some religion where God just wants you to follow blindly without knowing anything. You can, there's historical evidence that supports Jesus. You can, you, can, you can trace stuff down to Christ. And I said in the first service, God's not afraid of your doubt because healthy doubt will lead you on a hunt for questions. And as you start studying your questions, you'll start to find answers. Answers lead to the truth. And I'd like to say the truth has a name. His name is Jesus. Yeah. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. All roads lead to me if you're on the right road, if you're really searching, if you're really hungry. But some people have doubts, but it's a rebellious doubt. It's a doubt as an excuse. Like, ah, uh, I don't believe in God. Well, have you stud- No, I don't study anything. Well, I don't really believe God can do that. Have you tried him? Nope. And we just kind of put God in a, in a bucket and, like, you know, kind of, kind of push him away there. But doubting Thomas, he needed to be there. And, and I love verse 21 in John chapter 20. And I lost my spot here. 2021, 20, forgive me. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Think about that. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. The first thing, what was the first thing Jesus said to the people that were in the room? Peace. You have to know that someone's without peace in order to extend peace, right? So he says, in the same way, I'm, the, the Father has sent me, he sent me to bring you peace. That's the first part of it. So peace, he told them twice. Like a, a couple verses later, they probably got scared again. He's like, peace. Relax, this is okay. I'm here. We're going to get through this. We're going we're gonna to go through this together. What does the world need right now more than anything? Oh, man. I was watching stuff all this weekend. I was going on in Virginia. I had to turn off the TV at one point because I just couldn't watch it anymore. That stuff bothers me. I think about, you hear about wars and rumors of war, stuff going on with North Korea, all this other stuff going on. The world needs peace. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. He's sending you to be peacemakers. It's not sending you to start typing on Facebook posts. Well, why did they do that? You voted for them. It's your fault. Nobody does that at New Life, though. Praise the Lord. Sending you to be peacemakers, right? And then secondly, 
the manner that he did it. He showed them his scars. Here's evidence. Here, here's proof. You know what Galveston needs? Let me tell you what Galveston doesn't need first. Galveston doesn't need a church that everyone attends that's perfect and acts like they've never had anything wrong in their life. That they just come to church and they're like, oh, your worship's perfect, everything's perfect, and you're just, there's no signs, there's no crack in the armor, right? They don't need someone to tell them that they're, they're flawless and here's a, here's a list of rules to follow so you can be flawless with us because they can't amount to that. And they're not even going to try because that's not realistic. You know what is realistic? Pain. And in the same way that God is showing his scars, again, a scar is a mark of a wound that's been what? Some of you have been healed from something. God's delivered you from something. God's, God's washed you. God's cleansed you. And, and so many times we don't want to talk about the dirt because we don't want people to judge us and think about how nasty we were. But somebody that's currently in a nasty situation needs to know that someone is, is, that looks as good as you look right now, you used to be in the same shoes as I was? Hang on, you used to have stage what cancer? And you're alive? Okay, now I need to know why. I'm like that with weight loss stuff. We get skeptical. My wife and I, we ordered Nutrisystem. And uh, my wife, she stays beautiful. But she's lost 50 pounds, 5-0. Five, 50 pounds in like how many months? I don't remember how many months it was. Before we told people we were on Nutrisystem, we are like, whatever. Y'all are missing out on all this good barbecue we got up in Texas. Y'all do you. Right? All this barbecue. They give you a whole loaf of bread at some barbecue spots here. How crazy is that? I've never seen that in my life. A whole loaf? Not a couple slices. A loaf? Now, months later, they see my wife, and they see her 50 pounds less of my wife, and everyone's asking, all right, what are you doing? How do I get to where you are right now? You have to show me. Now they believe. There's a world out there that doesn't believe in perfection, but they believe in pain. There's a world out there that used to know how you lived, and they need to know that you're healed now. And you need to tell them. You need to show them your scars. You need to let them know, you know what? I was addicted to pornography at one point. You know what? I was molested as a child. You know what? I was fired. You know, I was this. I was that. I had negative things spoken over my life. You know, I was supposed to die. I wasn't supposed to be here today. But God. And you start telling them about the mercy and the forgiveness and the power of the God that loves them, but they don't know that yet. And really, they don't want to know about that yet. They don't want you to just walk up to them quoting scripture. Not that this isn't 100% true and accurate and the bread of life and everything we should eat. It is. But they could relate to pain right off the bat. And that's going to create a hunger in them to know, how did you get better? How did you get better? You were in jail with me. How are you? How do you have a family now and kids and you're up there raising your hands? What is that all about? Tell me about this. There's a world that's dying to know about God. And he's gone right now, right? He lives inside of us. He left us to be, to be his mouthpiece, to be his hands, to be his feet. What are you doing? Are you just content to come to church on the weekend? Are we still going to the highways and the byways? Are we still compelling them to come to Christ? Are we still telling them about our shame, telling them about our story? It's not just your story. Your story directs them to God, and your story brings him glory, and it brings children to God. God's waiting for that. If Thomas was doubting God, there's a world out there that's full of doubt. And they've been sold lies, and they're like, you know what? I've seen these gimmicks and schemes and different things with different religions. What's so different about yours? You're the proof. Your healing is the proof. And if you don't have a scar yet, maybe it's because you haven't been healed. And again, sometimes we feel so dirty. We don't want to talk about stuff like this in church. Where else would we talk about it? This is a Holy Ghost hospital. That's what church is supposed to be, right? It's, it was never intended to be a place where everybody who has all their stuff together comes and hangs out. If that was the case, I couldn't come to church, and I'm a pastor. I need God. I need forgiveness. I need mercy. I need his grace. I need him to wash me. I need him to keep me in love with him, keep me on fire for him. I need that. I crave that. It's not a museum where we just sit around and, oh, look at all these perfect people. No, we're hurting. I think about the Old Testament. There's a, in Leviticus, they use the phrase unclean almost a hundred times. Uh, there, was, there was so many rules back in the day in, in order to be ceremoniously clean. If you touched anything that was unclean, that literally made you unclean as well. So a clean thing touching an unclean thing would make the clean thing unclean as well. So there was rules. You read Leviticus. Some, some people say they try reading the whole Bible and then they, they stop when they get to Leviticus because it's, it's long, right? And there's a lot of rule, lots of stuff in there. But read through it. There's stuff where if you touch a dead body, 
you're ceremoniously unclean. If you touch someone or if you're going through a menstrual cycle, you are temporarily ceremoniously unclean. If you touch a leper, someone with a skin condition, you could be whole and healthy. But if you touch that guy on his shoulder, even if that was a clean patch of skin, you're like, I just touched him right here. Nope, you are now unclean. And sometimes we use that same mentality and we think, man, I can't, I can't come to God with this. I can't tell Pastor David that I'm unclean because then he'll be like, oh, you got to leave the church. You know, you got to get out of here. You can't have that. But I, think about how everything switched in the New Testament. Here comes God. And I think about all the people he interacted with. Was there not a woman with, a woman with the issue of blood? She was bleeding, currently bleeding. And she reached out and what did she do? She touched the hem of his garment. Did Jesus become unclean because a woman with an issue of blood touched him? No. But guess what happened to her? Woo, she got clean real quick, right? I think about, we talk about Lazarus being risen from the dead. We, we, you know, that was, um, you know, the little girl where, I forget, I forget the, the exact parable, so many parables, where, where um, they go to visit the little girl and he's like, oh, she's just sleeping. And they're like, <laughs> no, she's dead, God. You missed that one. And he's like, no, no, no. The Bible says he takes her by the hand, she just sits up. Wakes up a dead girl. He touched the dead body. Did Jesus lose his life and become unclean? Oh, but you better believe life sprang up into her, right? I think about the leper who approached God and said, he fights through the crowd. Lepers weren't supposed to be around other people. You have to wear like a bell. So if you heard somebody like with a cowboy right now, you'd be like, oh, there he is, there he is. Get away. Everybody get away. He's coming through the doors right now. Get away from him. Get away from him. Don't touch him. You should be in the parking lot, dude. Don't come in our church right now. New life is clean. Go, Right? But leper, he, he fought his way through the crowd, and he finds Jesus. I could just picture him dirty, skin falling off. And he's like, can't even look at Jesus. I'd imagine, says, Lord, if, if, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And I love it. There, in, the, in the New Living Translation, the Bible says that Jesus touched him, period. There's other translations that say Jesus touched him and healed him. So we think about that Pentecostal one. Ready? Are you ready to receive? And then nobody there, what do get? And they're like, Phew! and they were healed. Then that's awesome. Praise God. I, I grew up in a church like that. I love that. Get the blankets out. I'm all for that. But the Bible just says Jesus touched him. Period. Think about the last time someone actually touched this leper. And Jesus, I could just picture Jesus going down, like lifting his chin and just touching him by the face and looking at him for a second. He's like, he's probably thinking, like, what are you doing? You, <laughs> do you know what I had? Can't you see that I have this and you're. I'm dirty. I, I can't even, I don't know. I can't even live with my family because of all this dirt. And you're touching me right now. And he's like, I'm willing. And he tells him, be well. And he heals him. Jesus didn't get leprosy. Jesus wasn't unclean. So Jesus changes everything. My point is Jesus is bigger than your sin. Jesus is bigger than your hurt. Jesus is bigger than your problems. Jesus is bigger than your issues. And he invites you. to be healed. And what's crazy is Jesus wants you to be healed more than you want to be healed. Any good parent will tell you that when your kid's sick, you want that kid to be well more than they want to be well. You're like, I can't, I'd rather be sick. How many of y'all feel like that? Your parents are like, I, I, he's coughing, I can't even stop this, he's, and now he's vomiting. You're like, man, if I could take that upon myself, I would do it so that my son, so that my daughter wouldn't be feeling that way. God is a good, good father. He wants you healed more than you might want to be healed. 